Okay, so Community and Economic Development Committee, September 9th, 2021. Can we do the roll? Time to get ready for winter. Ready to pull the call. Ms. Howard? Yeah, Mr. Dunbar? Here. Mr. Dunbar? Here. Ms. Kennedy? Ms. LaFrance? Mr. Perez Gardia? Mr. Peterson? Present. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Mr. Rivera? Present. Mr. Weddleton? Here. Ms. Solitel? Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Can you hear okay on the phone? Yes. Okay, good, yes. thanks. Um, if you want to get in the queue, do you, do you want to just text me or you just want to chime in? I'll try texting and chime in otherwise. Okay. So I'll watch the phone. Just dial oh, oh, okay. Okay, first item on the agenda is the um, Alaska for Property Rights update, and that's uh, Chuck Hopp and uh, Sherry Curie, who we funded for doing outreach regarding the exclusive use claims by the Alaska Railroad. <laughs> And part of that was uh, monthly reports on their progress. So this uh, includes the second of their reports. Um, I think it largely speaks for itself. Did, um, Chuck is on the line. Chuck, did you want to, um, just for a couple of minutes, outline what you're doing, how progress is going on? Uh, yes, uh, thank you and good morning, uh, Chair Weddleton and Assembly members. I appreciate uh, your service and the opportunity to comment here. So yeah, just a brief reminder, the challenge that we're addressing is what um, the, uh, um, the the campaign believes and certainly um, our Alaska's uh, Department of Laws expressed through the governor's office that the railroad's um, exclusive use claim uh, to the entire right-of-way amounts to an uncompensated and unconstitutional taking of land. It's one of the reasons why the municipality of Anchorage intervened uh, in the suit against the homeowners in South Anchorage is because the municipality is also uh, similarly affected uh, in its interests by this claim. Um, so the goal is to raise uh, the awareness and education of the public in general to promote a groundswell of, um, of reaching out to folks such as yourself and, uh, and other uh, um, elected officials and public officials to take appropriate corrective action. The report in front of the committee highlights what those activities have been in August. It's everything from pretty extensive social media outreach, um, uh, direct mailers, refining uh, mailing lists to folks that live along the rail belt. Um, we we uh, went up to Fairbanks and talked with uh, uh, entities that were in similarly uh, impacted situations as businesses. Uh, Municip uh, municipality, of course, and property owners, as in Anchorage, got some historical context from those folks up north. Uh, we did speak with Mayor Bronson uh, very recently. That was yesterday, and he expressed his uh, unqualified support for this campaign. Um, I think earlier we shared with the committee the letter that Governor Dunleavy wrote to the Railroad Board of Directors and. Mayor Bronson has assured us that he will be sending similar correspondence, uh, ex expressing his agreement um, with the governor and with the um, utility companies, uh, homeowners and businesses and municipalities that are impacted by this claim. So that was very encouraging. Uh, that all was just ye uh, yesterday. Um, we are working on um, getting some editorials out into the major uh, newsprint media that also educate people as to why why this matters um, and why it impacts um, rate payers, uh, taxpayers, and things like that. Um, uh, another uh, Chair Weddleton uh, item of note is on August 23rd, NSTAR filed an amicus curiae brief in support of Flying Crown uh, homeowners Association, and they came at the question to the court from the respect of being a utility company, and they showed how 
the exclusive use claim has driven up all of our natural gas uh, ratepayer rates um, because of um, excessive uh, rates that they have to pay for even very, very short incursions into the bed uh, of the right-of-way, not under the tracks, but just even up to the 100 feet away from the tracks. Um, a couple areas, one near King Street, one near Potter's Marsh, and they pay more for that um, uh, a very small section, less than a mile of total access in the right-of-way than they do for another 400 miles of gas pipeline in Alaska. And, and what that ends up doing to our utility rates um, that they pass on to us. So give, again, similar to MTA um, and other telephone and electric co-ops, they're showing the court uh, what happens when um, a corporation is completely un unregulated and allowed to set its own um, rate based on uh, an unlawful exclusive use claim, uh, a claim that uh, utility companies are forced to bear and then of course pay, pass on to their rate payers. So uh, it's the, the, the campaign is definitely uh, doing what it intended. Uh, we, we see a, a groundswell of activity, a feedback from people up and down the rail belt. Um, Sheree and I are gathering these, these stories uh, these reports and passing them along to uh, people who you know want to hear about them. Um, additionally, we know that when this when this uh, the Alaska legislature convenes, next session will be another go around, and there's a uh, key legislation that we will be uh, uh, tracking and and helping uh, through the process that uh, establishes um, exactly what the nature of the property interest the railroad has in the right of way and what it does not have, and to be consistent with, of course, the Muni of Anchorage's position and the governor's position. Um, and also the governor has indicated he will be filing legislation um, on this matter, um, not necessarily with respect to the right-of-way, but to bring the railroad back underneath the Executive Budget Act so that they will be a department of state government subject to oversight uh, rather than an independent corporation uh, for um, oversight and supervisory reasons. So that's that's my report. Any any questions? Any questions from the committee? <laughs> Forrester, Chris. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you, Chuck. Um, good work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair Wellton. Thank you very much, Assembly members. Really appreciate your support. All right. So moving on, we have a discussion of vacant and abandoned buildings, ordinances. Uh, Bob Dole is here to speak to it. We have a few documents. Ron Thompson got his moose and he showed up. <laughs> oh, and uh, also for the record, Crystal showed up about five minutes ago. So, um, I guess just to, Bob, you should introduce it, but you have a document here. Yes, sir. The, I'm a De Development Services Director and Building Official Bob Dole. In preparation for this meeting, I have taken an extract of uh, Title 15 and Title 23 to assist in the discussion. Based on our having basically test drove this now for about five years, there are some areas I uh, wanted to, I think would be appropriate for discussion. Okay, why don't you dive in and describe them? Yes, Chair. Uh, Bob Dole, Development Services Director. And looking at the areas here, I, I think that um, I'll, we all want to get address nuisance uh, properties that are creating off-site impacts to the neighborhood and creating problems. There's areas, though, that um, have come up that we think we need to uh, take a relook at. First one, uh, that abandoned real property. Abandoned is a legal term um, that basically means to go forward, we have to prove that the owners intended to relinquish all rights. In it. Not just that they're not there, but they intended not to be there and they intended for not to own that property going forward. That's a high legal burden, particularly when you can't track down owners and you have to start paying to, uh, you know, for, uh, for ADN to advertise uh, if this is your property, contact us. So, uh, so um, and an abandoned property itself, as long as it's not creating an impact, may not, is it really something we want to look at? I think the bigger issue, though, is with a vacant building, there's nothing magical about 180 days that makes it 
a building that is having an off-site impact we're finding here. The assembly, when they passed this, recognized exceptions for vacation properties. Structure is only used on a seasonal basis. So they recognized 180 days and isn't necessarily an impact there. But the other side, though, where we see this come up is the person who has now had to go outside for cancer treatments. They didn't plan it, it isn't seasonal, but it's not an exception here. So we're gonna charge them $100 extra for that first year because they have to go outside for cancer. Or the senior citizen who has now had to move into an assisted living facility is still trying to sort out guardianship. And while we're, they're trying to sort out that, we're also creating a requirement, but your, building, your house is vacant. Your neighbor's keeping it up. Uh, your, your son is shoveling the sidewalk in the driveway, but it's vacant. You owe us 100 bucks. Or for the service member who moves up here and has deployed to Afghanistan, we're going to charge them an extra 100 bucks for deploying to Afghanistan or whatever ch other choice locations the uh, service sends them to because they build their house is vacant. It doesn't make sense. So I would posit that the vacant standard isn't of itself enough to um, means we should get there. Also, we're in the age of uh, modern technology. Now, Ron Thompson's a vivid fan. I'm a Ring fan. Uh, Ring is a system. With, with my doorbell, though, I know who just went down there while I'm here. My house is vacant. No one's home, but I know, I know who's going down there. So I don't think vacant in itself is dispositive of whether or not a house is being monitored. You can have friends, relatives, or technology to get there. So saying a house is a vacant, therefore a problem, isn't necessarily what we're seeing. Uh, Tutoring down then, but that duty to register, that duty to register exists so we can list these uh, properties and have a directory of them. We already have that opportunity, and we already do that, however, for dangerous buildings under um, AMC 2370. When we have a report of a building that's creating a problem in the neighborhood, and we create what's called a service request, and we track that house, and we have a means to do it. So we don't need to create a process where we go out, we contact the owner, then we require them to bring this form in, pay us $100, which by the time we do the staff time and fight SAP to deposit it, track it for a year, 11 months out, we go out to see how the house is doing, remind them they have to do something. Oh, it changed ownership. We have to find a new owner. It's, it's a loss leader, and we already have something that will en enable us to find those without making citizens have to come disclose to us their house is vacant going forward. Um, I would also note that on the next, um, the bottom of page two, the small F for abandoned real property, there is a process there. It really doesn't gel well with the rest of it. It talks about how we get um, statements that they're abandoning it to the muni. That doesn't convey ownership. If a property is truly abandoned, and we want to follow a process so it conveys to the muni. The, pro the process needs to be that we just contact the uh, real property department also uh, within this building, and they can facilitate that and also deal with any liabilities we may pick up if that happens, whatever is contamination is on it or whatever. So it's, it really doesn't fit well with the overall scheme going forward. Finally, um, yeah, we've had about 150 properties come off the vacant abandoned registry since it happens. Your sophisticated land managers, those at banks and all, they know the process, they do it. We have never ever had somebody come to us and say, we, you know, we quit having it vacant because we didn't pay, want to pay 100 bucks or 200 bucks or 300 bucks. Uh, you know, you can, a house is usually in six figures around here. Maybe you can find something in five. If that building is vacant and abandoned, a hundred bucks just doesn't matter. There's other issues there that need to be overcome. We're just adding another burden to do it. When we continue to move through Title uh, 15, 20, there are some good provisions there. I think the duty to sign, the duty to secure, flipping the page to page four, the duty to maintain, those are all good. Those are all good standards, well done, um, and not addressed elsewhere in code. And are, although I'm admittedly critical of the value of the registry per se, uh, I think these are value. And these, because there's ways to work with them, they don't increase risk to the property. When we create a registry, and this is our vacant and abandoned property registry, that's a public record that I have to reduce produce if I get a public record re, uh, request. That's basically a shopping list for a burglar 
It's a list of where to set up if you want to engage a, a drug deal or other illicit activity. And we're, and we're basically charging owners right now to develop that list to put their, make their property more vulnerable going forward. Uh, just in looking at there. And then finally, when they come off the registry, this is easy for the sophisticated owners that do this all the time. The one-time person who didn't realize there was a registry in the first place, we got them in, we got them paid, we got them on there, usually don't realize they have to come in to get it off the registry, so we have to go through more staff time to track them down. And if the house is occupied in beneficial use, frankly, who cares? I mean, what, why do we have to, why do we have the registry in the first place, but now we have, we've created this additional burden, otherwise the list has no value if the houses may or may not be occupied that are on it. So it presents a lot of problems. Um, last but not least, liens. Uh, when the, the language is written, I shall put liens on when these registry fees are not paid. These fees don't pay for the staff cost and the cost of recording liens and releasing them as they go. It further uh, is a hit on the 101 fund rather than adding to it. Would this be a convenient point to stop for any questions or should I proceed to tell 23? Um, let's, uh, I don't know if this, uh, uh, any questions for the committee? Uh, Crystal? Yeah, and I guess this is um, just in the terms of the definition um, abandoned. Um, you know, to me, I guess I think of abandoned means somebody's just walked away, they don't care anymore. Um, I can certainly see where a commercial owner may just decide that they're not using that for now or whatever. But I, I'm trying to kind of figure out where, what level of responsibility we're talking about here because it just seems to me that some people truly are, they just don't care, they don't want to have anything to do with it, they want to walk away and they don't care what happens to it. So how do you make them care enough to do any of these things like post a no trespassing sign or do a registry or take you know, Anyway, I, I guess I'm just really kind of struggling with that whole idea. The concept of abandon to me means that nobody's taking responsibility. So for that case where it has, where they're not doing what they're supposed to, uh, the existing 2370 gives me the tools to do that. It's a dangerous building when it starts having an impact. When the building is just as plain as the others, it's not having an impact. But when um, it starts uh, becoming a place where criminal activity is occurring, vandalism is occurring, um, it becomes a, a garbage dump for the rest of the neighborhood. I have the means already under 2370 to go forth and require them to deal with that, and if they don't deal with that, I have the authority to dispatch a contractor, preferably, or muni staff to secure it, and then we uh, contact them. They, if they don't deal with it, we lean on the property. So we already have that tool. We don't need this to get there. Okay, so there's a distinction, and there's a further distinction from an abandoned building to like a nuisance building or a dangerous building. So now, with the ab abandoned, until they convey property rights, even if they do these um, statements of intent to relinquish, they they still own it. I mean, you, you so we can, we can go against them that they're likely judgment proof. Uh, what we'd say that we're not going to get anything out of them. Maybe they're PFDs. But we have a means to go against them now uh, while they own that property for those impacts. And even uh, commercial owners for contaminated sites are notorious for trying to abandon also. It isn't just residential. So, so we have a means to go against them. And frankly, I think 2370 provides a better code path to get there. Okay. You know. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I got uh, Pete and then Forrest. Pete, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so I'm wondering why we've chosen this time to, to implement this change. And you know, I, I was here 35 years ago when we were in a severe economic downturn and depression, and people were leaving town and putting the keys to their house in the night depository, and the bankers were dreading coming into work in the morning because they didn't know how many more keys would be there and how many more houses people weren't going to be paying the mortgages on. And uh, I'm hoping that we don't get back to that point economically, but uh, it, it's it's just I'm just wondering if, why we we've, we've chosen to to move to this at this point. Through the chair, Assembly Member Pearson, I, I think there's two things that we have a separate foreclosure registry for the I don't want to say for the 80s, but for the 80s I think or that sort of scenario. But uh, we're bringing it up 
I'm bringing, I, I asked to bring this up now because I think we already had the tool in the toolbox to address that issue, to identify those houses, get after the owners, make them do what they need to, to return it to beneficial use and mitigate the effect on the neighborhood. Rather than using the existing tool we had in Title 23 at that time, we created a new tool uh, five years ago, and frankly, I don't think that new tool is as effective as using what we already had in the toolbox. And I can't speak, I wasn't here, um, Mr. Thompson wasn't here. I think it was a time of um, flux in the department with, they went an extended period without a director, without clear policy guidance. But we already have a very effective tool that also provides a full enforcement array of mechanisms from a prescribed process to a notice and order, authority to do the repairs and lean on it, a means for appeal administratively. That is all lacking under 1520. Well, I, and I, I was on the assembly when when we enacted the change, and and we had yet been getting uh, <coughs> complaints from people in neighborhoods that there there were properties that were abandoned, and they were um, worried that they were going to bring down the valuations of all the other neighboring properties, and so that was the motivation behind the, the changes, as I recall. The chair, and I, I think that the, the change was a, a looking at a, a uh, significant issue. We all worry about those in our neighborhoods, and our and our our residents do too. And we have to we have to deal with that. That's our responsibility. I believe we already had a tool that should have been utilized, rather than at that time uh, telling the assembly, "Let's do something new." Because I can run an info report now under those service requests we do for. Um, problem properties and identify the same list. We didn't need to create this extra registry and this requirement on citizens and residents to get there. All right, thank you. Anything else? Um, Forrest, can I go to Dean first? Just raise your hand. Sure. Okay, Dean, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, since Mr. Peterson asked why we have this change now, and I think you're speaking basically why we enacted um, section 15.20.105 for the vacant property registry requirement and I just pulled up the ordinance we enacted this in 2016 and there in our warehouses in that ordinance uh, there was a statement that the municipality lacks an effective means of monitoring vacant and abandoned buildings within its jurisdiction I think it was I think sort of a perception that we lacked actually monitoring and watching them and as Mr. Dole described, 2370 doesn't have its monitoring and watching. It's more, I think, very reactive um, to complaints from buildings. And you can correct me if I'm incorrect. It's more of a reaction to complaints about buildings that are affecting the area. And so this was designed, I think, to be proactive and require our owners to register. And I guess at that time, in 2016, the Department of Law drafted the ordinance and found there were 550 other local jurisdictions that had a similar vacant property registration ordinance, and they had a couple different types. And uh, I was involved, but I worked there at the time. A little bit, but not the primary drafter. Um, but I think that the, uh, that, that's sort of the notion, that there were a lot of complaints about the vacant buildings, and can we do something? And this was a solution at the time. And of course, with a lot of times, when we're not ordinance after implementation and a period of time, you see if it's really been effective or not effective, maybe unintended consequences and things like that. And I think that's what Mr. Doe has come to in protest today. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Forrest, go ahead. Thanks, John. Yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear Dean very well, so I'm not sure if he already addressed this. But I guess I, I have two questions for Bob. First, um, you'd mentioned the public records request for the the list. Have we ever received such a request? Through the chair, Assembly Member Dunbar, we receive that about one, some entity or another. I'd say uh, three to four times a year we receive that. We consulted with okay. the mini attorney's office and they determined we have to produce it upon request. And okay, well, wh what kind of entities are you talking about that are, is it like real real estate agents or, or like who is it that typically is, sent, is requesting that? Through the chair, Assembly Member Dunbar, it's been a mix of um, those who appear to be real estate agents, those affiliated with community councils, and private individuals. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Um, and then, you know, this might have been what Dean was getting at, so I apologize if I can't, like, I couldn't hear the answer. But, um, you know, we, we passed a number of laws that were sort of indirectly related to the Northern Lights Inn, uh, Northern Lights Hotel on Northern Lights, um, very large, vacant property, uh, clearly, I think, met these, um, you know, some of these requirements you have here in, uh, in 2370, uh, um, 707 for a dangerous building. And yet they felt, uh, I believe the administration at the time felt that their hands were, were tied to a certain degree. I mean, th they needed another point of leverage to try to get that owner to demolish that building, which of course happened. Um, and so we passed several ordinances, but I believe one one of them was was this um, uh, this vacant and abandoned building ordinance. So can you explain why? I mean, you know, they had pretty good attorneys um, in, in that prior administration. Why they weren't able to get a get leverage or, or convince that developer to demolish that building or secure that building using twenty three seventy, and why they asked us to pass. Um, this abandoned, uh, this abandoned uh, building and vacant building ordinance. Through the chair, Assembly Member Dunbar, the only additional leverage 1520 adds is charging them 300 bucks a year. Right now, in our version of our dangerous building code in 2370, um, I do not have the authority to direct demolition. Um, as the building official does in other jurisdictions for properties that are totally unsafe will never be safe again. Um, and, um, but I believe also to be candid with you, um, I see that as an issue internal to the Development Services Department and the information and analysis it was conveying to the administration at that time probably didn't optimally prepare them uh, for that. But neither 1520 nor 2370 give authority to direct demolition or uh, as is. 2370 has a better fine scheme uh, that it can build on a daily basis to incentivize demolition, but it doesn't give me the authority to say this must be demolished. Right, so okay, so I'm, I'm trying to look for, you know, it's not just 300, I remember we added um, D, um, now of course that, that goes to properties that have been vacant for a long time, but it's 10, uh, 10 cents per total gross floor area and, and with a minimum of 300. And I think the idea was that for large buildings and commercial buildings that that, that number would add up pretty quickly, pretty substantially. Um, are you saying that the, the fine structure, and if you could point me towards the provision with the fine structure uh, in this, you see here, in 2370, that you're saying that, it, that it's more aggressive than that D, that subpart D, um, 2D under, uh, under 1520-105? Through the chair, Assembly Member Dunbar, my apologies for not pulling out the, the uh, fine schedule. Depending on the nature of the fine, we could be looking at hundreds of dollars per day, per day under uh, Title okay. 23. So we had okay. a tool we didn't advise the administration of. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thanks, thanks, for um, uh, Dean, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, Mr. Denver, I'll try to speak up. Let me know if I need to raise my voice. Um, you had mentioned that you uh, had perceived that this ordinance might have been passed in reaction to the Northern Lights in, in that situation. Uh, I happened to work at the Department of Law at the time. I was involved in the Northern Lights in the um, process where we uh, um, requested the demolition of that property. Uh, this ordinance was not actually uh, a reaction to that. I think it was sort of an offshoot, tangential, and I mentioned that because uh, the Northern Lights Inn, it was handled almost entirely under Title 23. It was partly under General Public Nuisance Code, but uh, the Northern Lights Inn was already secured or required to be secured uh, by the fire code and the fire or state um, City Fire Marshal. So uh, 2370 was effective there, 
and because it wasn't secure, we proceeded under that as well as it being a nuisance to the surrounding area. Um, and that was before we had this ordinance. I uh, just wanted to point out that this ordinance was more um, driven by uh, residential properties that were abandoned and affecting residential uh, neighborhoods because they were an attractive nuisance to vagrants and uh, being broken in. And those were, there's more, those are more numerous for municipality and affecting residential areas. And those were more difficult to monitor and try and uh, bring Title 2370 procedures against them uh, because of that number. So that's more what drove this ordinance um, than the Northern Lights in situation. Um, Thank you. Forrest, any response? No, that's all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, anything else from the committee? I had a couple points um, going through this. And so I went back to some of the ordinances. And one is on the on Bob's page three with the fines. Um, I don't know that this is quite right. And I was going through the video this morning, and I didn't quite finish, but uh, for one, one, one of these. But and, and I should say, some of these things have my name on them, like Ron had pointed out. Um, part of it, there was an S version that was welted. That was just because I had some edits, so it became S version. And I think I ultimately voted against the thing. And then um, another one where I was added on the original document, too, was because I had a bunch of edits. So that's how you get on those sometimes. So I had mixed feelings. And, and Bob points were kind of what I was making at the point time. That some of these fines either weren't effective or they were exactly the point you were making. I had a neighbor who left for three years because his parents had cancer. You know, abandoned his house, but he made the right decision. So I so I agree with much of that. But anyway, but on these fees, my view is this one matches 2016-81S, what's shown here. But 2019-9-S had these a little bit different. The B was not 200, but it's 500. Um, C, not 300, but 1,000. And D became 10 cents per total gross floor area with a minimum of 1,000. Did you? So I, I was going back Through to the, the chair, that sounds right. I, I went and found one I could cut and paste into a Word oh, document, okay. and I didn't cite check in enough on the amounts. The amounts are never cited by um, those on the registry as a reason they're doing or not yeah, doing okay. something to us, and I, I missed that when I was cutting and pasting. Did you get this out of codes online? I did. So it's incorrect on codes online? Yes. And is this, what, what is the department referred to that you find? Uh, we actually have a print. We have the print off of the bills that we use uh, the actual AOs when we do the oh, fines. Okay, so this could be wrong. And, yeah. Okay. So I want mean, to make sure that's right. Okay. So probably good there. Um, on one of your points here, the 180 days. That's because it was 30, mm -hmm. and I amended it to 180, and it wasn't magic, but 30 was way too low. So I thought, let's try 180. So there is no magic to it. That was legislation. Through the chair, we have um, just our observations that we have inspectors out, and if our inspectors or the fire department or the police department knows buildings that appear to be creating problems, they contact us. Is that a vacant building per se is not the problem? A vacant building that is not maintained, not secured, is the problem, and that was kind of the gist there. Uh, we would posit that vacant in and of itself. Okay, so the guy's in Afghanistan. He'll come back, and meanwhile, his uh, wingman is shoveling out his driveway. Yeah. That's not an issue. Right. But it's when the property isn't being tended to, it's a problem. Yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, Dean, I saw your hand up. Oh, uh, yes, I had looked up the fines in our fine schedule for these, and so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, there were a four levels of fines. So the failure to register, the requirement of 105A, a failure to register had a $25 per day fine under the fine schedule. So that can ramp up very quickly. I think uh, about 30 days to do it, and after that, $25 a day is added to that fee that was in subsection A. 
So what if I be for the duty to sign, fair to sign, first offense is $200 per violation, and administrative costs, second offense in a calendar year of 500 per violation, and third and subsequent 1,000 per violation. Then what if I see fair to secure was uh, 200 per violation, second offense 500 per violation, and third and subsequent 1,000 uh, per violation, these are all in the calendar year. And then 105D, the failure to maintain, and I think that's got a lot of subjectivity to it, actually. But that's first off, it's also 200 per violation, second to 500, and third, 1,000. So I can ramp up very quickly. Okay. If I understood also how this is applied, and maybe Mr. Dole can help, the pro violations in our code are usually considered um, one day is a separate violation. And uh, code enforcement often works. For example, if they were signing, I haven't done this, so I need your help from the people with the boots on the ground. I uh, might have a code enforcement officer look at a building that has failed to sign as required by 105 uh, B, for example, and take a picture and come back 10 days later and take another picture of the sign still isn't there as required after they've been notified. And then they've got 10 days of violation between the first and the second picture. And as a separate violation, so that's 10 days. Yeah. And then they apply this per violation fine. So it grows very quickly. Through the chair, in those cases, there you're right. There is a daily. There are different daily fines that can approve failure to sign, failure to secure, failure to maintain. The challenge is, these this how this building wasn't getting what it needed in the first place because the owner didn't have the resources. So we can create a, a number that's infinitely large, surpassing the value of the property, and lean on it. It's not going to fix what's wrong with the property, though. Uh, is um, even with those fines that build. And I, I mean, we, we've recorded some significant liens out there against properties in fines for daily fines that have accumulated failing to correct actions. I mean, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, if you add, add all these up and the property was never corrected, uh, it's, it's judgment proof. Uh, and I would add that in general, all of these code provisions and the fines associated with them, the goal isn't to raise revenue from fines. The fines are help get leverage to induce and compel the property owner to fix the problem. So. And through the chair, for the value of a property, if it's falling into disrepair and becoming a nuisance, I would posit that increasing further the financial burden to return it to beneficial use is not the right incentive to get there. And not that we're seeing it is. It, it, these fines and all, um, it's something we'll end up working with when it's in foreclosure or uh, just when somebody contacts us for sale when it finally sells for another reason, but it doesn't actually make a house come return to beneficial use and come out of a uh, unsatisfactory condition any sooner. So um, one, going through the my notes and then the, uh, what I did in the video is, you know, key element from the administration was the uh, uh, homes owned by particularly out of state financial institutions or in this or any financial institution, but the problems are mostly with out of state. Is that who's the ownership? You have someone who's in foreclosure, so they may not have the money or the motivation to put any money any money into the building and the financial institutions said well they don't really own it yet so they can't go in and kick people out or really do any work on it because it's not theirs yet it's in foreclosure so the design here was to say to the financial institutions you have a responsibility you need to take on these tasks so that was a core issue with the, um, with the changes and that so is that taken care of some way they just found they had no tool through the chair, uh, 20, uh, AMC 2370, sorry, I keep going back to my monitor here. The pre-existing tool would already make that repair or make that happen. And uh, we use it for other means. And um, 
I think we have a decent level of compliance with out-of-state financial institutions. Usually they hire a local land manager who has a contractor who will do what they need to so we don't have to. But 2370 already provides that tool to do it. What we don't do, what 2370 doesn't do is create the extra transactional cost of the registry. That's the only difference. Okay, so did you want to go through 2370 then? Uh, uh, sorry, Dean, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. I uh, just wanted to make one correction to a statement here. Um, it was about the annual fee in uh, page three, right? subsection H2. So the printout we have and the online code are different. Mm -hmm. And I was just checking this. Um, you know, I kind of defend the code often. The code is correct because we had a change to this fee in 2019 by moving it to the amendment of the amounts. So online it's correct at 100, 500, and uh, 1,000. And I, I looked at the wrong site. Pete? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, and I remember we had a work session on this uh, years ago, and, and we actually had uh, people who worked for banks come and testify uh, that, that you know that there was sort of a catch-22 in the situation that you just described a moment ago, John, where uh, the people had left it, but the bank was not yet in possession, and and so it, it kind of put the muni in what we consider to be a, a, a weak position to uh, to do anything to 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 affect the change in that property, and and there. Uh, the banks felt like it, it wasn't their position to do anything because they had not taken official possession of the property either. And, and so, the, you know, maybe uh, Title 23 does, uh, you know, give us the ammunition to do what's necessary, but at the time we, we felt maybe it didn't. So we might have misinterpreted that, but that was the, uh, that was the information we were presented at the time. Thank you. Uh, can you address that? Uh, through the chair, Assemblymember Peterson, I would just offer we have used 2370 to secure two uh, complex commercial uh, properties that were in that um, gray zone between what before the bank got it and when uh, there wasn't somebody doing what needed to be done for it. And we haven't had any issues doing that, and we resolved our cost incurred with the financial institution once the, uh, they they did what they needed to to claim ownership. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Bob Phelan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I guess going off of what some other folks have said, you know, just just looking at some of these ordinances that we have passed over the last few years, some before several of us were on the body. Um, you know, it, it looks like these were intended to sort of layer on top of each other. So um, I guess for me, I, I want to get a better understanding of what what specifically you and the administration are proposing, and then um, want to make sure that we're very clear on any possible unintended consequences, because, you know, this, this set up what, what looks like, you know, a fairly intertwined structure, and so if we're messing with any part of it, um, I want to make sure that it's not crumbling as we do that. So um, I guess for me, I just want to understand what, what you are proposing and then how, how it's going to differ from the ordinances that we have passed. Through the chair, for uh, I, I offer we're having a conceptual discussion here, and th this is um, giving a boots-on-the-ground perspective of the Development Services Director. This isn't necessarily the position of uh, the Building Services Director or his boss, uh, Mr. Tromley, or the mayor. But I would posit that what we should keep what's working and is effective and useful and look at where we can, uh, other things are not necessarily the same value added. In doing it that way, I would posit that the registry is not value added given what 2370 does for us, but the duty to sign, duty to secure, duty to maintain are value added and I um, ideally would be retained. I, would, I, I think would, could probably fit better in 2370. Other jurisdictions have adopted the ICC International Property Maintenance Code that would create language similar to that. Since we haven't, 
I think rolling those provisions into 2370 and not uh, creating the registry and maintaining the registry since we can get that same list of properties anyway would be a better way forward. I would also offer, if you looked at the definitions on um, page six of what I uh, uh, sent you all, uh, particularly number 12, number uh, 17, and number 18, we can get those properties now under 2370 that need to be gotten. So we can, we can bag those, we can track them as service requests, we can produce those reports or registries keep track of them and get after them to benefit the neighborhoods. Using the, the best tools of uh, 1520 are the duty to secure, sign, and maintain. So I would offer, and this is, I would offer Bob Dole, the building official, not necessarily anyone else at this point, that the way, a uh, preferable way forward would be to remove the registry and roll those other portions into 2370 going forward. The other advantage is 2370 has a defined process to address those issues. Is it really vacant? Is it really not in disrepair? Is it really creating those issues? The, the, co the, uh, the code abatement officer does the notice and violation. They have an appeal process to me. Uh, if uh, they disagree with my findings, they can go to the building board, which is important for dealing with structural and decay issues. And from there, they can pursue a judicial process. Uh, it's far more effective, brings earlier expertise in that rather than going through an administrative hearing officer route of Title 15 and then to the courts, we can do it faster, better, cheaper, and I think, uh, frankly, at lower cost to the constituents and be more responsive to them. So um, if we look at that, there's a lot of great ideas out there, and I think the one part I'm admittedly critical of is the value added of the registry. Felix, any follow-up? No. Anything else? Um, okay, so do you want to go through Title 23 section? Or? Sure. If we, uh, through the chair, uh, Bob Dole, Development Services Director, if we turn to page six, I have ex I pulled out some relevant definitions here that I think are useful for this discussion. You have uh, 12, which talks about a damaged building becoming a problem, uh, and uh, I won't read it to you out loud. You also have 17, which I think talks about that nuisance or that public nuisance or that is directly what Title 1520 was uh, trying to do. And we also talk about those damaged buildings in uh, number 18, which we used recently when there was a garage collapse near a playground where kids were and we had to go out and fence it immediately with an unresponsive owner. We didn't use 1520 for that. So we have those tools there. We also, if need be, can use number 17 to roll in, or when, um, or number 13 to roll in a requirement from another body of law uh, also there. So 2370, in short, gives us those tools without needing the separate section as written. Okay, uh, Crystal? Thank you, Actually, this section is my, I'm, the next thing on here might answer my question, but um, I was curious about the process by which you get the authority to actually go on to some of these properties and make these assessments, and how much of a, a process is that? I'm assuming, assuming that the landowner or property owner is not, haven't, hasn't given you a permission or isn't a, a available, or how do you go through that, walking on to make uh, these kinds of assessments? As particularly if it's something that's just deteriorated over time. Through the chair, if you, uh, uh, Vice Chair Kennedy, if you turn to page seven, we touch upon that in uh, 2370, 703.3 and 703.4 spell out when and under what rules we can or cannot uh, do that and, and uh, what, what we'll uh, have to go about. If we have an occupied building that's secured and they can deny entry, we basically have to go for an administrative search warrant uh, if it comes to that. Uh, uh, but generally, access hasn't been an issue. Um, uh, the bulk of the time, either it's a cooperating um, landowner who knows they're in over their head, or <laughs> 
and uh, they're, they're just looking for help. They, they don't know how to deal with it either. And or it is one where um, a tenant or someone else with a property interest will give us access. Uh, so the ex or you can just see it from the street and you don't have to go on. So. But muni officials can do this. You don't have to have an AP, a sworn officer to escort or anything like that. Through the chair, vice chair Candy, that's correct. This is all a code abatement uh, employee. Uh, any of the inspectors uh, can do these things. The only time APD comes with us if we're doing a board up, uh, that is, we have either the owner's permission to uh, secure it, they can't afford it, we'll lean on the property, or in exceptional circumstances, we do it and then lean on. APD will clear it first, so we do not board it up with someone inside. That would be bad. Chair, I know there is a budget line there, but I will follow up and okay. find out um, what happened to that. This is kind of a report, though, because you're saying, hey, this isn't working, but yes. <laughs> it is a broad package. On 2019-75, in, in, included in the packet, I think you must have sent these to Mandy, a variety of the ordinances that are somewhat related. Mm -hmm. So one was 2019-75, and that... Yeah, just read the title. Delegates Title 15 code enforcement to police or peace officers. And I think the peace officers was the new addition there. So the Since chair, it's Title 15, can that move to Title 23? Through the chair, yes. Title 15 can move to 23. It's not a criminal enforcement. By saying peace officer, our code abatement officers, land use enforcement officers, are sworn peace officers, which is separate from being commissioned police officer. That's how we address uh, Vice Chair Kennedy's concern about they're doing law enforcement without having to tie up an APD resource. So Title 23 already uses code enforcement. So when we did this to Title 15, it's because that does not typically use code enforcement. Is that correct? Through the Chair, Title 15 uses uh, code enforcement in some cases. Usually they roll over to uh, land use enforcement officers. In this case, because of where they usually arise, they roll over to our code abatement staff instead and develop it. Services. Okay, so I don't want to lose whatever benefit this. Is. Well, that, that's, that, that, that part's so easy to bring okay. over the sworn officer. Okay. And then 2019-9, amongst other things, made the dedicated nuisance property abatement fund, and that has some value. Is that so? If we change the thing to Title 15 that we did, would that go away? For the chair, I, I believe if for the changes we're discussing here, we would change. We would not create a mandatory source. Uh, you would not tax me a hundred dollars when I go to Afghanistan to add to it. Instead, we would rely on the other twenty-three seventy fines to continue adding to it. So it would not go away. Just we would remove a revenue source of uh, tech billing people because their property is vacant. Okay, but, that, but the specific fund would. Continue to exist. Yeah, so it would continue. Because that was, I think, code enforcement. Like Jack Frost came to us and said, We don't have the easy money to go through this stuff, so we can't go in and abate a nuisance thing. But if they have this fund specifically designed for it, my impression from that discussion was that now he has more of the tools to go do what Title 23 requires. Through the chair, that fund would stay there. However, the, pro the properties would, that would pay into it would be what I would call real problem properties, not just those that happen to be vacant. Dean? I was just going to uh, thought nuisance property abatement fund where it included um, other properties for public nuisance code and not that were abandoned but where the owner was there but just had the junk uh, all over the place, got fine swing. Mm -hmm. And so that will continue and that will but helps uh, provide financing for the municipalities, costs to do a cleanup and then attach a lien and collect. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Pete? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, I believe we did get a report at least one time that I recall, and it was after they had finished cleaning up that property in Bear Valley that had been a nuisance for uh, over a decade. And uh, so I, I don't know whether we've had additional, I don't remember we've had additional updates and reports since that time. Okay. Well, well that leads to some question, because these are issues in, in, in my district, but one was um, property at the end of Gander, um, kind of the north end, that was persistent, and the owner was um, basically out of action in the hospital. He was essentially homeless, so his um, nephews or something claimed that they could stay there, and the squatters were there, and they just said, we have permission. So APD felt they had no recourse, but the place was getting, there was no toilet facilities, there was half a dozen people living there, it wasn't boarded up, and that took years to get any progress on, and finally it was boarded up and cleared, uh, the city went and took junk off of it, and it's been good ever since. Francesca, were you aware of that one? Um, it was also huge, and finally we cleared that up, but it took many years. And there's a new one, I think it's on Heights Hill, it's just a falling apart building that I know has had some code enforcement attention and we might email about that. So are those under Title 23 or this new 15? What, what would happen to those? Through the chair, I, I think in looking at those, um, we did a board up um, about two weeks ago now that was uh, Kitty Corner from uh, Central Middle School, I think, or Pite or whatever it's called now. We did that under 23. The owner was unable to um, secure it uh, due to personal circumstances. We contacted the owner. We went, um, met her at the facility where she was currently at, had her sign the trespass form for APD. Then the code abatement officer met APD out there, presented them, them with the form. And once that form is signed, APD can arrest folks that go on the property. They also cleared that so we could board it up without unintended consequences. In doing that, though, the key part there, though, was code abatement did their job. And if that job involves getting that form to someone who can sign it, even if they're in a homeless camp, a facility of some sort or otherwise, and that we did under 23, but that's just doing what you're supposed to do, boots on the ground work. We, uh, why those other ones took years, I don't have a satisfactory answer for, but I know it took us, I don't know, three days on this last one. Uh, part of it may be money. I mean, to do Francesca, he had no resources to clean it up, and he went to court, and it was a huge dollar amount, so. Uh, we, we do have a nuisance, through the chair, we do have the nuisance property fund that we that will pay for plywood and we lean on the property if need be. Okay, good. So, anything else from the place? So, how would you like to move forward? Uh, I'd like to phone a friend at this point. <laughs> Sorry, this is Ron Thompson, Building Services Director. Uh, I believe that we wanted to come here to find out what the interest was in being able to change. Sounds like there is a possibility now uh, for fixing and cleaning up Bob's suggestions. So basically we'll let Bob move forward with uh, uh, suggested changes and we'll go through the normal process with that. And hopefully uh, now that we understand what the changes were and what the intention was and we also know what the result was we're going to clean up make it better and have a better process that that does what we have we've also cleaned up the dangerous building process and reflow charted that work with our inspectors which is i think what led to this is i think they had flow charts they were following years ago that just got abandoned and we've resurrected those since we've been back uh, the staff now knows and follows the exact procedures which then Therefore, the time frames will be better, the, the follow-up will be better, the support will be better whenever we take it to the level that goes. So, so when we talked the last time, it was trying to understand the intent. Now we've kind of went a little bit further, kind of presented what we might think needs to be fixed. Now it's about going and making those changes and bringing them forward. So we'll put those in writing. It sounds like we have a pretty, I think Bob has a good direction. I think it's good information. Bob brought it to me and said, this is something that we can fix. And I think what I've heard today and in the past uh, month about and discussing it, I think we're in a good place to make good changes that, that meet the intent of what was intended with these changes. 
uh, and just cleans it up, makes it cheaper, makes it more effective, and, and that's, I think, what we're all about. So uh, we'll bring a proposal to you to suggest the, the minor revisions. It's not like major revisions here. It's just trying to, I think, clear out the registry, put the things in the right location, and give us the tools that we can efficiently do it for an effective uh, price and not eat up this this repair fund by doing things that we shouldn't waste our time with. And, and I think that's the direction that we, we hear. I think everybody seems to be on the same page with where we're going. And so now it's up to us to present a good, sound way of doing that. Okay, so would you, um, I would say, go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Um, Ron, I do have a question, or maybe even Bob. In terms of staffing and what you know could be the savings in all of this, I mean, obviously there's a lot of staffing time involved. Do we actually save positions, or do we just allow people to basically focus on things that are more important? With I the idea they, going forward with some of these reviews. This is Ron Thompson again, Building Safety Director. Obviously, we're going through the budget. We're looking at positions as well as uh, effective use of those positions to do effective job. And at the end of it, we will suggest what we believe will be necessary to do it. Um, nothing is off the table, so we are looking. If, if we can eliminate uh, work that is not needed, then we would eliminate the person who, uh, the, the, the process and if we have other process to work, then great. If we don't, uh, and we're, then we'll have to make the tough decisions at that time. But we're willing to look at those tough decisions and make the right call. Uh, and the whole point is making permitting efficient, using computers to make things better, and efficiently doing and meeting the goals of the intended uh, ordinances. So that's what we're trying to do, and if that affects the number of people, then we will deal with that at, at that time. But we should be able to give you a report on that at that time. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? Okay, so would you draft something and bring it here, or you just want to draft something and put it through the normal system? Uh, we'll, we'll probably draft something, put it through the normal system, and then you guys are aware of that it will be coming. Well, I'm sure Adam is trying to make sure that we uh, inform you when we're getting ready to make change, especially if it's been something that the assembly put forward and was have, trying to have a result. We want the same, I mean, obviously we all want the same result, but we want whatever's been done to be effective. Right. And if we're not effective, I think it's our job to come back to you and say, hey, this is not effective. Here's how we can be effective. Do you agree? I think that's why we're here now. And I think Adam will continue to do that as we go. I mean, just like we did with the code changes, those are code changes that'll make us more effective and better, but still get the result of a good, sound, solid, um, and so those are those have been uh, will be introduced I think on on Tuesday the code changes for 21 and 23 so you'll see those very soon um, and so I think Adam's approach is he wants to keep you informed he wants you to be aware nobody wants to bring something forward that surprises people we want to be open honest but at the same time with a goal to make things streamlined effective um, and and I've heard both from the assembly side, the mayor's side, the mayor's all that about let's streamline permitting, let's get development moving, let's clean those areas up that need help, and that's what we're trying to do. And with that, we want you guys to be the most informed because at the end of the day, you're going to be the ones that make that decision for us on where we go forward. So that's kind of Adam's approach. It's similar to my approach, and that's why we're here on this one, and we'll continue to be. In, in the coming, you know, we'll ask if we have time and we'll ask if we can get on your schedule at times. Um, but other than that, that, that's kind of our approach. So I think that, that the answer is yes, we're going to continue to present. But but when we make that decision, we'll submit it and then we'll go through the normal process and, and have a document to, okay. to finally approve. And, and when that happens, my general preference is, you know, we introduce it, um, have the public hearing. And then if issues come up in the public hearing or from assembly comments, um, possibly postpone it or something, send it to the committee to hash those things out. Perfect. And then move on. And if nothing comes up in the public hearing or from assembly members, deal with it that night. So, so I think that's fine. 
Yeah, that, that's the same approach that we would hope to have, so absolutely. There, there are times where assembly members want it before we have the public hearing and have it come to the committee, and that's, that can happen too. I find it a little less efficient. But Okay, anything else on this? So we'll, when would we expect to see this? Uh, I would say uh, I would say that with Bob knowing what he's doing, we'll probably put an ordinance together within a few weeks and get it in one of the next agendas. Maybe if we can get on the September 28th, if not the next one after that. And I would prefer on all of these things, including the Title 20, 21 and 23s, is to stick to the regular process, yeah. like not even the addendum. Regular, because that is something that people will be watching. And if we do anything to speed it up, it creates suspicion. Right. One else? quick question on that, or just one um, clarification on that, is the code changes are going, This the, these code changes that we submitted last week didn't make the main agenda, they are on the agenda. Right. So just to be clear for you, I mean, normally we will try to get it without it being on the agenda. In this case, we think these code changes are that important, and we got on the PNNC committee and the building board uh, agendas, and we're going through the, the assembly at the same time. But what we wanted to do is make sure we got it to the assembly before those public meetings on the PNNC and building board. And so that's why it's going on the addendum this time, because it'll be on uh, Tuesday's meeting on the addenda, but normally it would be on the main agenda, correct? Okay, there might be a separate topic, but if you have Title 21 changes come to us, and then, but they'll also go through the Planning Commission thing, so we actually won't see it for action until after the April. After the, uh, yes. So after. you have quite a bit of time, could be a month or more easily. Yeah, it's just reporting times. Um, they're just doing it through concurrent paths because we both Title 21 and Title 23 have to go through their respective boards. Uh, between the time that you introduce it on the assembly and the time for action, those other meetings will take place, and so you'll have the recommendation of those other groups. Okay, well, that's good. I think the sense that things are rushed is what people worry about. Yeah. They don't want to give that impression, so okay. All right, well that is um, final point on the agenda. We have um, anything else from the committee? Audience participation? Mr. Haberman? My name is Eugene Carl Hayman. I represent myself. Follow the public process. When the public process is done appropriately, decision made by the governing body is more likely in the public interest. Um, tomorrow morning, you're going to assembly and the school board are going to have a joint meeting. It's in the mayor's conference room, and even before COVID, it was not really a good room to have a meeting. It's very tightly fit, hardly any member of the public could be there. At the school board meeting this week, I addressed them and pleaded with them to not have that meeting there. And note, uh, as you know, I attend a lot of meetings. And there, at the meeting of the school board that I attended, it was a rare situation where I felt more safe because everyone in that room was wearing face coverings. Everyone in that room was wearing face coverings. But here you've got the school board meeting with the assembly tomorrow morning, and the end result is it's not uh, following through with what the school board is, is handling the responsibility of COVID. And uh, you've got meetings this, this afternoon, assembly, work sessions, and uh, the end result is uh, no public comment, but the fact is, we got them in the city hall, and that's more downstairs. And even before COVID, these rooms were not fit for you to have meetings there. It needed to be in the site library, in the semi chambers. That's where they needed to be. But in a time of COVID, one would think that you would be more responsible. But I'd like to also make a reference to a statement about uh, that came out of a letter of Senator Member of France this week past few days ago in response to the administration. And the fact is, the concern the administration is not doing something, let's put in, in as what they, assembly members would hope, the fact is, assembly members can do something in the meantime, simply holding these meetings in the assembly chambers 
and be more respectful and responsible to the di in the situation dealing with COVID. You don't need a mandate to do that. You're in charge of where you're going to hold your meetings. And right now, it doesn't make sense when you're telling the administration something about let's work together and do something more. You can simply have your meetings in Lucet Library in rooms that are more safer for people to attend. And technology is more connected so people can hear you and you can hear from the public. So I plead with you to end that meeting and these meetings if you have any of these other places and start right now immediately, affect immediately to move them into the proper settings. And then uh, that's all because I only have eight seconds to spare. Right. Thank you, Mr. Haberman. Anyone on the phone? No? That's it? Ready to adjourn? All right, we're adjourned. Thanks.